Hello, good evening to everyone. Welcome to this fourth lecture of the series Photography and Chance, a series that we've been involved in this week, directed by John von Cuberta. It was a series done with the Panoramic uh, Festival. This collaboration began last year, and this is the second edition. And I just wanted to say, remind you that you can uh, send in your questions using the chat and John von Kubet will present and chair the session and we'll uh, pass the questions to Clement. Thank you very much, Clement, for your participation in this series. It's an honor to have you here and remind the uh, followers and viewers that in the next few weeks, we'll have all the lectures of this series on the website of KBR. Uh, I also want to thank John and the uh, Panoramic Festival for your uh, collaboration. And I want to say that for KBR MAFRA Foundation, it's very important to work on networks like this. Thank you very much. And I'll pass the floor to you, John. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good evening. We're going to begin the fourth and last session of this cycle, this series of lectures on the relations between photography and chance. And the closing lecture, we have chosen one of the most eloquent people, one of the most eloquent speakers, Clément Chéroux. Chéroux is uh, a player on the international pho uh, photography scene who has had a lot of influence on uh, vernacular popular photography. And if you look at his uh, entry in Wikipedia, he's called the lawyer of vernacular photography. But that may, um, but it's much more than that because his career has well, has a series of uh, very important points that we should very briefly go over. He studied at the school, National Photography School in Arla. That is to say, it was a practical training in photography. And that has given him as a historian and curator, a dimension of knowledge of training the nature of photography beyond what can be learnt uh, in museums or libraries. And he studied history of art, did a PhD at the Sorbonne, and he was head of, the head of uh, the department was of Etudes Photographiques, the magazine of the French Ph Photography Society, which publishes theory and history uh, material regarding photography. He was curator of photography at the Pompidou Center and at the San Francisco Museum of Art. And currently he is the head of the Department of Photography at the uh, MOMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Clement is interested in the classics, he's done books and exhibitions on Cartier Bresson, Walker Evans, but at the same time, he looks for the outsider areas of photography with, that we spoke about yesterday with Joachim Schmidt, that photography that has been overlooked in the more academic circles. For instance, he did a book and an exhibition on photography of uh, ghosts, spirits, all this uh, area, vernacular area that began in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, and uh, continued at the beginning of the 20th century. And he did, he produced another book, an exhibition on the, on mistakes, accidents in photography, what he calls photography, but FAO, for photography. And um, a character, a person like this, who's been interested in the avant-garde movements in this period of tw the 20s, the 30s, 
the Weimar Republic, modern photography in France. This speaker could be a speaker who has a huge knowledge of all this and how chance has been an engine uh, of the avant-garde in photography uh, with techniques like automatic writing, the uh, surrealist methods uh, use chance to, to, to do their art and to do their work because the magic of chance is what led to dissolving the obsession for control that was present in traditional art. So chance ha is one of the engines of aesthetics that has renewed aesthetics. And regarding photography, it is obvious that uh, it contributed to, uh, to break up the unstable agreement that uh, images had had with uh, chance because cameras never allowed the operator to be fully and completely aware of what the result would be. So the history of photography has run uh, alongside the history of chance. And when we look at this issue, we can, uh, well, we might say that photography is a chaotic system. For documentary photographers used to follow a series of rules that uh, allowed them to predict results, their results. They obeyed the rules and they, they were convinced that they could predict the future. But experimental photographers would uh, act freely and would uh, go for unpredictability and risk in the face of that deterministic way of doing things. So we have to think uh, of the history of photography and the current uh, state of the arts and think whether this allows to uh, continue to delve into uh, chance. Chance was born in the 19th century uh, was supposed to be objective, but it was chance that really allowed photography to become more subjective. So these are some of the issues that, from the point of view of a historian, are going to be developed by Clément. And I'm sure that he will give us an answer to very interesting aunt, answer to many of these questions. So Clément, when you're ready, you have the floor. Thank you for being here. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Joanne, for your uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, the MAPFRE Foundation and Panoramic for the invitation um, to talk today. Um, I'm so sorry that I cannot be with you uh, in Barcelona. I'm speaking from the Museum of, uh, of Modern Art here in, in New York. Um, and I would like to start this lecture, so maybe we can, uh, uh, have the first slide, please. Um, yes, I would like to start. So first slide, next slide. Um, I would like to start this lecture with a quote from Man Ray. Um, in 1967, in an interview with a journalist, um, the journalist asked Man Ray what type of camera he used. Well, um, this is not a very original question. Um, photographers hate being asked this kind of question because it implies that uh, if the photograph is good, it's because the camera is a good one. Uh, so the question was not so great, but the answer was quite amazing. Man, Man Ray answer, and I quote him, to make a picture, you need a camera, you need a photographer, and above all, a subject. Behind this very uh, simple answer, the reply shows Man Ray really great understanding of what photography is. His answer means that photography is structurally composed of three elements that interact with each other, a subject, a camera, and a photographer. 
This is what I usually call the photographic system. It's a complex system with three main elements, uh, a subject, a camera, and a photographer. And today in my talk, I'm mainly interested in showing that chance is present at all these different components in all these different components of the photographic system. Chains may occur in front of the camera, in the subject. Chains may occur in the camera, uh, in the technical device. But chains may also occur behind the camera with the photographer himself. So this is how I would like to organize my talk today by questioning the importance of chance in photography at all the different stages of the photographic system. But before I start, uh, I would like to briefly address a question of vocabulary. I have so far used the word chance because um, it is the topic that was proposed by, by Joanne. But from my point of view, chance is definitely too broad to talk about what occupies us uh, today. As, every know, as everybody knows, um, chance can be good or bad. We talk about uh, good luck or bad luck. And I truly believe that we need an adjective um, to narrow the field of chance. Um, good luck can lead to an interesting photograph but there is a very little probability that a great photograph will result from bad luck. What I mean here is that most of the images that we are going to talk about today are not the result of chance in general, but rather the result of a smaller portion of chance that is good luck. And, um, there is in fact one word that corresponds exactly to this positive aspect of chance, to the uh, good luck or the good chance, and the word is serendipity. Next slide. The concept of uh, serendipity was pioneered by Horace Walpole, who appear here on the uh, left side of your screen. He was an English writer, an estate, and a politician. In a letter to a friend written in um, 1754, Walpole recalls a Persian tale that he read when he was a child. The tale is called The Free Princes of Serendip, and it takes place in an island which is called Serendip. Uh, which is located at the latitude where Sri Lanka is uh, today. The story is very simple. It's about these three princes of Serendip. And um, every time they fell, every time something wrong happens, for a reason or another, their bad luck is transformed into something good. Every accident is turned to their advantage. And from the name of this island, Serendip, where bad luck is transformed into good luck, Walpole created, coined, the concept of serendipity. Next slide. The word serendipity entered the Encyclopedia Britannica in 1876 and in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1880. And this is mainly from the middle of the 20th century that the concept started to be used more broadly. And it was used a lot in the US in, and especially in the, vocabulary, in the vocabulary of science. Serendipity designates the probability of seeing one's mistakes eventually committed to success, but also of discovering something without having really searched for it. And there are many, many things that in, particularly in science, that have been discovered without looking for them. Think, for example, about electromagnetism that was discovered by chance. Think about aspirin. Think about uh, X-rays. Let's have a look at the next slide. 
the German scientist Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen was working on something completely different when he discovered the strange property of X-rays to show the bones of his wife and through her flesh. Serendipity basically described the positive part of luck or what I could call, what I would love to call the fertility of chance. In the field of, so it was definitely something that is super important in the history of sciences. But in the field of art, it also exists way before the world in itself was coined. From Pliny to artists like Antai, from Leonardo da Vinci to August Strindberg, Hans Harp, Marcel Duchamp, or Georg Brecht, the list is long of those artists who have explained the benefit that they had experienced from chance. Beyond the provocation of the formula, this is also the meaning of Picasso's famous quote, I do not seek, I found. Je ne cherche pas, je trouve. Um, Picasso was, was saying that. More than chance, it's serendipity, which is at work in all the photographs we are going to talk uh, today. So let's start uh, next slide with that kind of serendipity that occurs in front of the lens in the subject. And this is exactly what uh, the Californian artist John Baldessari questions in his 1973 work, throwing three balls in the air to get a straight line, best of 36 attempts. That's the title of the piece. Two years before, let's have a look at the next slide. Two years before that series, Baldessari had already done a piece with a ball as part of a collective performance on P18 here in New York, a project that was organized by MoMA and photographed by Ari Shank and Janos Kender. The idea was to try to center a bouncing ball in the frame of the camera. Baldessari knew that the photographer Shank and Kender were really great photographers. And he was interested in challenging their ability to perfectly compose their photograph. And I would like here to quote Baldessari. I was, he said, well aware of their reputation and my strategy was to prevent them from making beautiful photographs. I figure they would be so busy trying to center the ball that they couldn't compose their image, end quote. And let's have a look at the next slide. So two years after this first experiment with a ball, um, Baldessari took up the same idea again, but this time in California, trying to create a line with three balls uh, thrown in the air. So the first time it was a bouncing ball that he was uh, throwing like that. And the second time he's throwing the, the, the three balls uh, in the air. And his wife, uh, Carol Wixon took the photograph. So that was not uh, Shank and Kender, but his wife. And out of the 36 attempts, he tried it 36 times, each year he shows only 12 photographs, the most successful ones. And as you can see, he shows the most successful ones. So that clearly means that the work is about serendipity. He's not showing the bad luck, he's only showing the good luck here. And I'm particularly interested in three things here. Um, first, the Californian um, aspect of this project, the char characteristic blue sky of LA, Los Angeles, the palm trees that appear in few images, and those orange balls that remind us oranges, the fruits, uh, that are so intensely uh, cultivated in California. Next slide. There is also a clear reference to Marcel Duchamp, whose retrospective Baldessari had seen at the Pasadena Art Museum in 1963, so next to uh, Los Angeles, and in particular to this, uh, to this famous piece, the free standard stoppage that uh, was present uh, in, in this exhibition. On 
so I'm sure you all know this, this uh, Marcel Duchamp piece. So the idea is that is that in three occasions, Duchamp dropped uh, on the floor, on the ground, a one meter uh, thread, uh, and then he drew up uh, the form of the thread on the ground in order to question the chance in art, how chance make create forms. So that was all about that. Uh, let's have a look at the at the next slide. Um, as Robin uh, Kelsey has shown in his uh, book Photography and the Art of Chance, which features one of the photographs uh, from this series on the on the cover, Baldessari appropriated Duchamp's idea and reverse it as he thrown the balls in the air and try to get them aligned. So he was trying to come back to the idea of the line, which was the origina original idea of, of Marcel Duchamp. Uh, so it's all about reversing Duchamp. And uh, what is interesting to me here, both in this performance and in the previous one on, on Pier 18, um, it's, it's that it's, it's about 36 photographs. Uh, in the title of Baldessari works, uh, throwing three balls in the air to get a straight line, best of 36 attempts. Um, the number 36 is in parentheses, but uh, although it is in parentheses, it's super important because it refers to the number of shots in a 35 uh, millimeter photographic roll. So both in this uh, performance in the other, it's about the idea of taking uh, an entire uh, film of, of photograph. And where Duchamp was questioning chance in art, Baldessari is questioning chance in photography. Uh, all um, at the time, of course, we have to put that in, in context, uh, at the time when uh, street photography was in full development in the United States. And I must say here that um, Baldessari belongs to the same generation as someone like Gary Vinogrand, who was the, um, the photographer that embodied at that time in the US the idea of street photography. Uh, at a time when the notion of the decisive moment, we are gonna come back to this idea uh, in a few minutes. So at a moment where the notion of the decisive moment was discussed almost everywhere in the, in the US, Baldessari, through his, this, this piece, which is, a, I would say, a, a masterpiece of conceptual art, uh, Baldessari is asking to the photographers, how many, how many successful photographs do you think you can get uh, on a 36 uh, view film? And what is the part of chance in this success? So the piece is really about that. Um, and finally, uh, so it's a reference to Duchamp. It's a piece which is about uh, chance in photography. And finally, there is something that I'm super interested in that I just discovered in preparing uh, this talk and that I would like to share with you uh, today. What is important here to know is that there is no vintage prints of these uh, photographs. There is no, no vintage print uh, circulating. Of course, there is probably somewhere in the estate uh, 36 prints that were used to create that portfolio. But what is important to know is that um, uh, the, the, the series that you see Every time you see it in a museum or in an exhibition, uh, in fact, it's a portfolio of 12 lithographic prints. It's not original photograph, it's a, it's a print, uh, which were printed in 2000 copies. So it's a, it's a multiple, uh, which was printed in 1973 by the Italian gallery Toselli and the printer uh, Jim Polo Prearo. So whenever you see that works in an exhibition or in a museum, it's in fact a series of lithographic reproduction. But let's have a look at the next slide. Um, while I was uh, preparing for this talk, I discovered completely by chance that certain portfolios, which has been sold in recent years, contain not 12 prints, but 30 prints. And I couldn't find any explanation uh, about that. Uh, this is not something which is unintentional. The printer did, didn't had uh, one print because the 13th print 
is a different one. So this is not something which is unintentional. Uh, it, it is Baldessari. This is obviously on purpose. It was done on purpose and it fits perfectly uh, with Baldessari's facetious and uh, subversive, subversive uh, spirit. He probably introduced a 13 image in some of the portfolios that now we can find sometimes on, on, on sale. Um, and I would like, of course, here to remind you that uh, 13 is the number uh, associated with bad luck, uh, as if the artist wanted to tell us that bad luck could also be, be good luck, meaning serendipity. Let's talk now about, so that was about the serendipity in front of the camera, in the subject. Let's talk now about the kind of serendipity that occurs uh, within the camera and more broadly within the technical process. Man Ray, and we come back to Man Ray here, is probably the best example to talk about that. Let's have a look at the next slide. During his entire career, uh, Man Ray has been a champion of serendipity. I took advantage of accidents, he said, as the greatest scientists took advantage of chance, end quote. Let's have a look at some example. Uh, next slide, please. In 1922, Man Ray took the portrait of the Marquise Luisa Cassati. Her apartment, located on the Place Vendôme in Paris, was equipped with an old electrical circuit. As soon as the photographer plugs in the powerful fluid lamps that he brought with him for the, uh, the photographic seance, uh, the electrical circuit went off. So Man Ray had to operate with daylight in a rather dark apartment, meaning that he has to operate with a very slow exposure uh, speed. He asked the Countess to come near the window and he asked her not to move, but he recalls in his uh, autobiography that she was dancing in front of the camera. So even if you ask her, do, please do not move, she was dancing in front of the camera. Uh, and when Man Ray uh, developed his film after the session, he realized that uh, they were underexposed and for some of them uh, blurry. In one of them, the contest, the one that you see on the screen is depicted with a triple pair of eyes. Um, Man Ray, told her on the phone that uh, unfortunately the shot, uh, the whole seance was a failure, but she insisted on seeing the film um, and um, he sent a print and against all expectations, she was delighted. Man Ray has been able to photograph her soul, she said. The same year, next slide, the same year, Man Ray also rediscovered by accident the principle of the photogram, an image made without a camera. One day, he recounts in an interview made much later, one day, while I was, while I was uh, enlarging photograph, an object happened to be on the sensitive paper and left a mark on it. I then randomly placed keys, chance, pencils on the photographic paper letting the light marking the paper. The light distorted them, created refractions, and there were all kinds of natural phenomena during the process. I had come across a process of making pictures without a camera." End quote. Next slide. But the most fascinating story is undoubtedly the discovery around 1930 of the process called solarization. Lee Miller, who was Man Ray's assistant at the time, recounts, and I'm quoting here Lee Miller, something passed in between my legs. I screamed and switched off, switch on the light. I didn't find out what it was, maybe a mouse, but I realized that the film has been exposed to light. A dozen negatives of a nude on a black background were in the developer tray. Man Ray grabbed them, dipped them into the aposulfid tank and look at them. The unexposed part of the negative, the black background had under the effect of the light been modified to the edge of the naked white body into a thin black line, end quote. 
these three cases are, from my point of view, really great example of a kind of technical serendipity. Something unexpected happened in the process. The photographer was not looking for it. He was not waiting for it, but he understood as soon as he saw it, that it was something interesting, and then he decided to exploit it. I would say that in the history of photographic modernism, Man Ray is definitely the artist who exploited serendipity the most. It does pave the way for what will become experimental photography, this artistic approach that explore the potential of the medium by subjecting each of its technical components to serendipity. So to summarize, uh, I would say that there is a kind of serendipity that happens in front of the camera and another one that occurs in the technical process. And I would like now to discuss the case when the photographer is himself the agent of chance. Let's have a look at the next slide. Henri Cartier-Bresson and his famous uh, decisive moment is a great example to talk about that. Cartier-Bresson coined the term decisive moment for the first time in his book, uh, Image à la Sauvette, which was translated into English uh, as the decisive moment and both edition, the French and the American one published in 1952. In the introduction of the book, uh, Cartier-Bresson used a quotation from the memoirs of the Cardinal de Retz, uh, and especially a quote, and, and the quote is on the screen, there is nothing in this world that does not have a decisive moment, end quote. Let's have a look at the next slide. The decisive moment, um, the expression designates for the observer of the world in motion, a sort of climax. At a precise moment, things are organized in an order that is both aesthetical and meaningful. The decisive moment is a kind of formal organization that reveals the essence of a situation. In Cartier-Bresson's own word, it corresponds to, I quote, the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second, on one hand of a meaning of a fact, and on the other hand of a rigorous organization of visually perceived forms which express the quality of these facts." End quote. A photograph, the one which is on the, on the screen, which was taken in a, a bull ring in Valencia in 1933, offers a great example of a decisive moment. Next slide. First of all, it is extremely well composed. Um, it's an amazing uh, image. It's so well composed. Um, and it's of course composed to the principle of the golden ratio. The image is divided into a series of almost homothetic rectangles that repeat and respond, and respond uh, to each other. Next slide. In the left part uh, of the image, there is a kind of target with a number seven in its center. And in the background, there is a kind of blurry figure uh, whose body extend and repeat the form of the number seven. Next slide. The face of this uh, figure in the background, which forms uh, a light spot, is in the center of a series of concentric circles. One of these circles is tangent to the head of the other figure on the right in the middle, uh, of which appear another circular shape. The photograph was taken at the precise moment when a light reflected uh, and transformed uh, one of the lens of the second person in the image. You have to imagine everything is moving the photographer is moving, the two people in the image are moving, and, and the, the guy with the hat is moving his head, and Cartier-Bresson capture the exact moment where the light fall uh, on, this, uh, on one side of his, uh, of his glass. The image is not only 
extremely well composed. It also offers a symbolic condensation of the situation, the circular shape of the arena, the act of framing, the tension of the querida, et cetera, et cetera. The picture is in the words of Cartier-Bresson, the simultaneous recognition in a fraction of a second of the combined organization and meaning of a fact. Cartier-Bresson was always very clear that he didn't see all this in his viewfinder when he was shooting the scene. The scene. Um, it was a sort of combination, he say, a sort of combination of chance and unconsciousness that has made him press the button at that precise moment. In fact, what is interesting is that at that time, uh, Cartier-Bresson was uh, very close to the surrealist movement in, in Paris, was very close to André Breton. And uh, in a text on André Breton, the leader of the surrealist movement, Cartier-Bresson wrote, I quote Cartier-Bresson, I all respect an allegiance to surrealism. It taught me to let the photographic lens, to let the photographic lens rummage through the rubble of the unconscious and of chance, end quote. And so this idea of chance, unconscious, the kind of unconscious which is able to recognize chance at the moment where it appears, um, this is what really uh, lead Cartier-Bresson to that kind of decisive moment. A year before he died, he was still saying in an interview, I only believe in chance. While preparing this lecture and selecting all these images, I realized that it was often quite difficult to isolate one kind of serendipity from another. Most of the time, there are several forms of chains combined in the same image. Let's come back to the, uh, to the quotation of Man Ray with the next, uh, with the next slide. Um, if we take the categorization proposed by Man Ray, a subject, a camera, and a photographer, the image can result from two combined serendipities. I mean, of course, it could be only one of them, it could be the photographer, the subject, uh, the camera, but it could be also uh, a chance, chance happening in both the photographer and the subject, or both the photographer and the camera, or both the subject and the camera. So you see that it makes a lot of com possible combination to try to understand where is exactly the serendipity uh, happening. And of course, more rarely, the image can be the result of a conjunction of serendipity that appear in each component of the photograph, with the photographer, with the camera, and with the subject at the same time. And this is the case, uh, next slide, with this extraordinary photograph by Jacques-Henri Lartigue. The photograph was taken in 1913 during the Grand Prix of the Automobile Club de France. Lartigue was at that time trying to capture the Schneider number no. six, which was uh, driven by René Croquet, a famous uh, motor uh, racing uh, uh, pilot of that, uh, of that time. Lartig uh, wanted to capture a kind of portrait of the car and its pilot. This is what he was interested in doing, a kind of portrait of uh, the uh, driver and his, and his car. And in fact, after developing his negative, he realized that uh, the image was not exactly what he wanted to, to do. At first, he considered his image as a failure, as a mistake. Um, and of course, for that time, it was a complete failure. Uh, the car is blurry uh, because the car is too fast. The car is cropped, uh, next slide, uh, because the um, photographer was not fast enough, enough to capture it. And there is several time, um, in, in several time, uh, Lartig was quite often photographing these uh, cars race. And uh, there is quite a few times in his diary when, when a car is cropped, he said mal prise, uh, meaning badly taken, meaning that it's clearly uh, a failure. And uh, next slide. So the image 
is a failure because the car is blurry, because the car is, is cropped. But uh, what is the most uh, fascinating thing in the image is its distortions, which was completely considered as a failure at the time. Um, what is interesting in here is that uh, Lartigue used a camera which was equipped with a curtain shutter on the back of the, of the camera. Um, and let's have a look at the next slide that will explain why the car is distorted. Uh, when the shutter scans the image vertically at a speed which is slower than the moving object, it created this kind of distortion. Uh, and let's come back to the next image. This is why the car uh, is uh, leaning on the, uh, is leans uh, to, the, to the right. But uh, of course, when I say that, uh, you, could, you, you, should be, uh, you should ask me, but if the car is uh, um, leaning to the right, why did the spectators in the background lean to the left? So there is something completely illogical here, because if the shutter was going like that, the car was going like that, there is no reason to have the, the, the people in the background uh, leaning to the left. Uh, and there is a very simple uh, explanation to that. Uh, Larty made a movement to the right to follow the car with his camera. This is something that he knew, he spoke about it in his, in his diary. This is something that he was doing at that time. He knew that it, it create a kind of interesting uh, effect. Uh, but of course, it was not uh, fast enough to capture the, uh, the car. And uh, the fact uh, that... Uh, the camera is moving to the right, makes it's, it's kind of, it creates a kind of relative movement and it explains why the spectators in the background are leaning to the, uh, to the left. Um, so you, um, you understand that um, this image is the product of three serendipities, that of the subject, that of the photographer and that of the, uh, the camera in itself. Lartig was so surprised by this combination of serendipities that he first considered that his photograph was a complete failure. It wasn't until years later, looking back, uh, coming back to his archives, uh, that he realized that in fact, uh, this photograph was not a mistake, uh, but an extraordinary image. Today, let's have a look at the next slide. Today, it is certainly the most famous photograph the next one, please, not the previous one. Next slide, yeah. Uh, today, this is set, certainly the most famous photograph of Jacques-Henri Lartigue, and it is reproduced on the covers of many, many of his, uh, of, his, of his photographs. So what I found very interesting here, what is quite clear is that all photographers are not identically equipped to face serendipity. Man Ray, immediately recognized the benefit of his solarized negative. So he was immediately able to see, oh, look, that there is something interesting here. Lartig took a few years to understand that his failed, his so-called failed image was indeed a masterpiece. And there are other photographers who never understood the value of serendipity in photography. Let's have a look at the next slide. I'm of course thinking here of Ansel Adams. Now that I'm not working anymore in San Francisco, uh, Joan uh, um, was saying in his introduction that I've been working for a few years for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. So now that I'm not anymore working in San Francisco where Adams uh, was born, he was from San Francisco and his whole career was made around San Francisco and he's revered uh, as the most important photographer in the 20th century in San Francisco. Now that I'm not anymore working in San Francisco, I can say without being, without risking uh, to be booed or to be insulted or even canceled, um, I can say that I think that Ansel Adam uh, is the most, the most anti-serendipity photographer in the entire uh, history of photography. He has always denied the role of chance in the production of his images. Uh, let's have a look at the next slide. For him, it was all about making and not 
taking a photograph. It says a lot in these two words, making or taking. Uh, and of course, taking is much more subject, subjected to serendipity. And in most of his writings, Adams claims uh, for what he called pre-visualization, meaning the control over the production of the image. His conception of photography leaves no room at all for serendipity. And um, John Tcharkovsky, who headed uh, the MoMA's photographic department for uh, almost 30 years, was, was quite critical about this desire to control the photographic process. And I would like here to quote Tcharkovsky. Let's have a look at the next slide. So I'm quoting uh, Tcharkovsky. So much in photography is, or might be, at least partly the product of accident, that one should, bury, should be very cautious about saying, no, it was intentional. This is especially true since those photographers whose work most rigorously excludes the role of luck generally produce the most sterile uh, pictures. And Tchaikovsky continued by quoting James Agee, uh, the famous writer. James Agee point out in his most beautiful essay on the work of Ellen Lewitt that luck is one, one of the cardinal creative forces in the universe and one with which the photographer is uniquely equipped to collaborate. The photographer is uniquely equipped to collaborate with chance. There you go. We could easily end up uh, on such a great quote, uh, which is uh, from James Edgy, quoted by John Tchaikovsky. But I would like to add a few more words to conclude. I started this talk by explaining that serendipity could be present at every stages of the photographic production, the photographer, the camera, and the subject. Until now, um, I have deliberately dismiss the question of the viewer, the viewer whom Marcel Duchamp described as the one who, as the one who makes the, uh, the image. And it is obvious that serendipity is also present in the moment of looking at the image. Let's have a look at the next and last slide. There is a work by the American photographer Charles Arbutt that demonstrates this so well. It's a work called Picture Bandit, and it consists in a jackpot, a slot machine that controls a random projection of three images. The work was presented in 1969 for the first time uh, using photographs from the Magnum Archives, the Mag Magnum Agency, of which Arbut was the president at that time. Visitors could play with the casino inspired machine pulling a crank, they would trigger the random and simultaneous projection of three photographs. During the research for her PhD on Magnum, the French historian Clara Bouvres rediscovered this amazing uh, project. In the Magnum Manifesto exhibition that we curated uh, together, uh, Clara and, and me, uh, for the ICP in New York in 2017, we recreated this installation, and this is the color slide on the right of your screen. The idea uh, behind this project, this Arbut project, is that a photograph is never alone or isolated. All the photographs are surrounded by other images that potentially modify their understanding. Serendipity also plays an important role in the way we look at the photograph. If the photographer is uniquely equipped to collaborate with chance, as A.G. and Sharkovsky were saying, I truly believe that the viewer too, that the viewer too is uniquely equipped to, color, to collaborate with chance. Thank you for your attention. Muchas, muchas gracias, uh, Clément, por esta presentación.
Thank you very much, Clement, for this presentation. It's a summary of theory, photographic theory regarding those, those variables, photography and chance. When I listened to your talk, you're, you were thinking, you were talking about chance and saying that chance influences the uh, creative process. But on the basis of your examples, for instance, Cartier-Bresson, Man Ray, etc., or Lartigue, chance produces an effect. Okay. But don't you think that what is important really is the attitude after, afterwards, when the photographer sort of uh, reaches a kind of balance with chance, accepts the result and gives it a new meaning. So chance is an ingredient, but really it's a kind of consciousness that is no longer random. There's the culture, there's the education, there's the social cultural environment there's the artistic environment all those factors finally validate the result of chance or not so it is no longer an accident a mistake or a bad result and it transforms it becomes the result of serendipity the result a kind of epiphany what do you think? What can yeah, that's, you say about this? That's, that's exactly that. I completely agree with you. This is the reason why I wanted to um, talk about someone who was not receptive to chance, who was Ansel Adams, uh, because I truly believe that uh, there is the phenomenon, um, there is uh, what's happening, and there is the ability of the photographer to recognize that there is uh, something interesting there. Um, and I truly believe that this is the most important thing. Uh, the photograph has to be in a position where he is receptive to chance. Um, he has to be open. He has to be receptive. He has to think, he has to believe uh, not only in the concept of the, that is the author, that is the only person who is creating, but that things around him the subject, the camera can also bring something that he was not expecting and that these things could be more interesting than what he was expecting. And this is truly what I, what I like with the, the, the Picasso uh, quote, je ne cherche pas, je trouve, I'm not seeking, I'm, I'm finding. It's really, here Picasso is really talking about the fact that he is in a position where he's expecting, where he's waiting, where he's, um, um, he's waiting for things to come to him and, and he's putting himself in a position where um, chance will happen and he will be able to recognize it as something interesting. Uh, and it's something super interesting. And sometimes you can see that um, some artists or some photographers are, um, putting themselves in a position of receiving a uh, chance. I'm thinking particularly here of uh, uh, the French photographer Bernard Plossu. Bernard Plossu is a great example of someone who is always putting himself in a situation where he's not controlling. For example, he's taking photographs between day and night with a long exposure time, which is, um, something which helps uh, the chance to occur or the accident to happen. Uh, Bernard uh, Plossu is also taking a lot of photographs from the train window, the bus window, the car window, where he cannot really control his subject. So he's putting himself in a situation where things are going to happen and he's going to be ready to accept that he's not the only uh, the only author of his image, that his image is a kind of collaboration between the subject, the technical environment, chance, and also uh, the person who is going to look at the image. And so um, I think this is the probably the most important thing, 
uh, this attitude of the artist uh, who is able or not uh, to accept uh, chance. Muy bien. Um, uh, Clement, um, sé, sé que tienes una limitación de tiempo. Very good, Clement. I know you have to leave, so um, you can tell me when you've got to leave, but I, I would uh, happily carry on with more questions. But you tell me when you've got to leave. As a historian and a curator, you are one of the guardians of the essences of photography. In my present introduction, I said that chance could be an argument, could be a criterion. Uh, would you be able to write a history of photography where the differential element of the evolution and progress of photography were the relationship with chance? I would love to do that. I published a few years ago uh, uh, a small book which was about photographic accidents. And in a way, it was a kind of parallel history of uh, chains uh, into photography because accident is the production of, uh, uh, of something that happened by, by chance. So this project was, was all about, about that. I would love to reconsider this whole history of, of chains in, in photography that. Uh, that existed since the, the beginning uh, of the history of photography. I mean, in the discovery of photography in itself, there was a lot of chance. Uh, there is still today a lot of chance. I mean, so many photographers are telling anecdotes about uh, the way they have made their best photograph. And there is always a component of chance uh, in, uh, in that. So there would be, yes, a, a, great, uh, a great history to, to write about that. Um, and I would say that also, as a curator, uh, chance is very important in my work. I mean, encountering a photographer or not is sometimes due to chance. Uh, being in a place at the right moment or at the wrong moment is also, um, is also something which is related to chance. Uh, so I truly believe in the role of, of chance in, in what we are doing, for sure. Maybe let's take one, one more question. Very good. In the first lecture, Eloise Canessa, Eloise Canessa, the worked, I think, with you. She was a fellow at the Pompidou Center with you. Um, she spoke about a very interesting thing where he, she established chance as the result of accidents that produced creative results, and another chance, which was a method which is systematic, a kind of quote-unquote trick chance, a chance that is somehow regulated. In the case that you've mentioned, Man Ray and Lee Miller, with the invention of the discovery of solarization, there is an accident. They are doing pictures, taking pictures, and all of a sudden the light comes on, the uh, films get exposed, overexposed, and effects appear that nobody knew about. Now, after that, there's a systematization. Deliberately, they overexpose, they use the light, so they repeat things, and they become masters in solarization. And that is no longer chance, it is the result of method. Do you think... Yeah that that is a trick kind of chance, or is it legitimate? Is it a kind of domesticated chance that is less authentic than real chance, than real serendipity? Yeah, it's a super, super interesting question. And um, uh, the whole history of experimental photography is about that. Uh, the experimental photographers were putting themselves in a situation where uh, they expect serendipity to happen. And then they will, as you say, they will transform the chance into a recipe or a trick or something that should happen again. And um, there is a, um, Man Ray is talking about that, I think in one of his texts or in interviews, I can't remember, where he's talking about the difference of um, he discovering um, um, discovering solarization 
and the other photographs, photographers that have tried to um, domesticate uh, solarization. And I think he's talking about uh, Tabar, the French photographer, who has made a, uh, a lot of research on solarization with calculation. What, it, what, does that, what does that make if the light is here compared to the moment where the light is here? Uh, what does that make if the flashlight solarizing uh, the negative is, uh, is, uh, um, uh, is 10 seconds instead of five seconds? So uh, Tabar really works seriously on the question of, of solarization to try to uh, to control it. Uh, and we come back to the idea of the control versus uh, chance here. And Manra is very clear about the fact that we should not try to control chance, because if we control chance, in a way, we kill it. Uh, we kill the chance by, uh, uh, by trying to, to just to, to control it. So I think with, uh, that's the big challenge with experimental photography. How can you continue to rely on chance and not um, and not um, uh, crossing uh, a threshold where you enter into something which is different and which is control. And as Sharkovsky was saying, uh, I truly believe that control in photography is uh, is a bit sterile. Uh, it's not clearly uh, control is not what is producing the most interesting uh, photograph. So there is a, a threshold. And the most important thing is to see where is the where is the threshold. I will abuse your friendship with another question from the audience, which says, what do you think Edgerton would think about this? And we'll finish with that. Super question, super interesting. Um, it's clear that Ed Gerton was, uh, he was a scientist, so he was trying to control, uh, to, to control his images. But his images um, kept a part of uh, mystery, a kind of epiphany, to, to use the word that uh, um, Joanne was, was using a few minutes ago. So that's clear. It's control, but it's still there is still something happening in the image. I am not sure that this is related to chance. This is probably much more, from my point of view, much more related to the fact that it's a photograph of something invisible. It's a scientific photography which is revealing something that we haven't seen. So I think this is where lied the uh, epiphany, not in the fact that it's. Uh, control, so not change anymore. Well, thank you very much. We'll let you go back to your responsibilities and go back. To the history of photography depends on you, so we're not going to keep you any longer. We're going to continue. And uh, we thank you very much for being here, for your time, your ideas, your intelligence, your brilliance, and see you soon. Thank you very much, and continue to produce theory about Thank you so much. Uh, all this, which enriches all. Thank you very much, Clément. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Bye-bye. See you soon. Vamos a seguir unos minutos. Nosotros todavía es una pena que no it's a pity we haven't had more time during the uh, presentation. I think there was another serendipity that I would like to explain. When uh, Clément Cheroux has shown us the slide of Man Ray with the solarization, the nude of Lee Miller, it was the first time that uh, this effect of solarization took place. But this effect of solarization, and you must ex excuse me, I am part of a generation of photographers that have spent a lot of time in the dark room. And I'm one of those who, from the beginning, went to the uh, shop and bought the photographic process uh, products and, and did uh, and uh, developed his own uh, photographs and it was hydroquinone uh, 
and uh, potassic uh, bromide. And uh, when cellularization takes place, there is like a black line that divides the white parts from the dark parts, and that is called Sabatier effect. And this Sabatier effect uh, takes place when a plate or a, pho a photogra photographic plate or is being developed in such a way that in those areas of contrast, there is a concentration of uh, potassium, potassium bromide, which traces that line, that silhouette, in the case of the photograph that we've seen of the uh, nude uh, picture of uh, Lee Miller. So it's a paradox that is the result of chance. And uh, uh, these lectures are called uh, KBR, which is uh, potassic bromide as a result of chance. There's been a tremendous coincidence there, which is quite seren which is the result of serendipity. Good. Well, this has been the end of uh, this uh, cycle, this series of lectures. I think that uh, after four sessions, we have been able to uh, enjoy different uh, approaches that go from Luis Conesa, who did a presentation which was full of data, information, and through her we discovered authors and experiences that we were not familiar with. So I felt as if I was learning a lot and finding many different aspects that were very interesting and at the same time uh, creating a theory regarding the uh, development of uh, uh, chance in creation in contemporary photography. Then we had uh, Monica Bello who spoke about that uh, relationship between science and artistic creation which uh, could confront the, uh, the ability to predict things, the ability to the ability to be rigorous enough in order to lead our lives. And on the other hand, the fact that we are always subject to areas of ignorance and chance, which are probably uh, part of the nature of the real. And uh, centers like the CER where Monica Bella works and that are therefore constantly uh, using the theory of quantum physics, where reality, it does not necessarily, is not necessarily what we see, but different results that can coexist over time and space that leads to uh, the possibility of an idea of uncertainty as an element that is part of nature and history. And uh, it might seem science fiction, but it is the course of uh, science right now, the avant-garde of uh, science. Yesterday with uh, Joachim Schmidt, we enjoyed that uh, iconoclastic attitude, experimental attitude that always looks at things from a different perspective and shows uh, the antipodes of the photographic establishment, which today has been represented by Ansel Adams, pre-visualization, certain fixed qualities that have been foreseen beforehand, a whole system of photography that is based on discipline and rigor of uh, rules and uh, that lead to res the results that the photographer has determined beforehand and therefore they are associated with determinism scientific determinism as the philosophy to understand reality and against that or versus that we have people like joachim schmidt who always looks for the paradox looks for that surprising element that can be what 
happens, for instance, when we're able to change our point of view, change the use of what we're doing, circulation, etc. And Joachim Schmidt works a lot uh, on the effect of circulation of images and pictures. And that is something that we have perhaps missed in the lecture of Clément Chéroux. There's the photographer, there's the subject, there's the camera, there's the spectator, but then images have their own life. And within their own life, within that circulation of pictures, chance also can play a role. And finally, today's uh, lecture by Clément Chéroux, based on his deep knowledge of history, and the fact that he is constantly involved in the MoMA with one of the most important uh, collections of photography, he has given us, spoken about issues that have to do with the anthology of photography, but uh, with a perspective, the perspective of a young de los clásicos, de, de, del uh, tratamiento académico de la fotografía, sino también de eh, esas nuevas miradas a lo colateral, a lo marginal, aquello que tal vez desde la estética no ha sido tan valorado, pero en cambio desde la sociología, desde la antropología, desde la psicología. Who is familiar with anthropology, psychology, and has a tremendous uh, knowledge of this. I think that the cycle of lectures, therefore, has not exhausted the uh, theme completely, but it has offered uh, very interesting perspectives and significant and eloquent to show that we have materials uh, that we can uh, think about, reflect about, and will probably give us room for thought and fruit for thought and uh, uh, ways of rethinking photography. This cycle of uh, lectures, as you know, is one of the ingredients of the uh, Panoramic Fest Festival this year, which is uh, complemented with uh, seminars, lectures, exhibitions, and a whole series of activities, all of which look at the same subject, which is chance, uncertainty, and as elements that affect the world of uh, uh, images. And all these exhibitions will be revisited, and I uh, encourage you to do so if you haven't uh, seen them. And I must thank the MAFRE Foundation for their uh, collaboration that we've begun with this second edition. I want to ask you too, those of you who are interested in this type of topics, to continue with the next uh, few series of lectures and to uh, meet again next year when Panoramic is going to deal with things that have to do with nature, ecology. The title will be after the landscape with all these uh, crises, climate change, problems of uh, the environment, uh, landscape, the habitat is really very, very important and a critical issue that we have to think about. And many pho photographers and artists and filmmakers are working on these uh, topics in a very significant way. That is all from me. Thank you for your attention and uh, see you soon. Good evening and see you soon. Thank you very much. And we will now have a panoramic uh, beer. Thank you very much.